Hi, it's Jen Taub. Welcome back to Booked Up, a podcast that features you, me, and our favorite authors. We release a new episode every Sunday morning. Today, my guest is Taylor Lorenz. Yes, the Taylor Lorenz. I'm now so close with her, I get to call her Tay-Tay. She is author of the new book, Extremely Online, The Untold Story of Fame, Influence, and Power on the Internet. Taylor Lorenz is the sometimes controversial, never boring, technology columnist for the Washington Post business section. She covers online culture and the content creator industry. She was previously a reporter for the New York Times and has written for numerous other publications that you have heard of, including New York Magazine and Rolling Stone. Taylor Lorenz frequently appears on NBC, CNN, MSNBC, CBS, and the BBC. She was also a 2019 Knight Visiting Neiman Fellow at Harvard University. The New York Times said, Extremely Online aims to tell a sociological story, not a psychological one, and in its breath, it demonstrates a new cultural logic emerging out of 21st century media chaos. The Washington Post said Taylor is infectious in celebrating the tsunami of creative youth culture. Lawrence gives us a clear and compelling history of how the money came to flow into amateur-made short video content. Okay, let's dive in. Hey, Taylor. Hi. So where are you? It looks like a hotel background there. Yes, I'm in a hotel in San Francisco right now. Um, I'm on book tour, so I've been doing events all over, and this week I'm in SF. Exciting. And how is that book tour going? It's going really well. It's been so crazy. It's my first book, so I am I feel like I've got training wheels on, but I'm starting to get the hang of it. <laughs> You're lucky that, you know, COVID is... I, I, can I say over? I mean, but at least the COVID protocols are over because it means that you can actually do a physical book tour. Like it's so much nicer than, I mean, maybe, or maybe not. I'm not, not. Maybe lucky. Gonna... <laughs> I'm not lucky about that at all, Jen. Um, I, you know, I'm not, I, I'm actually very, it's been incredibly stressful and difficult. Um, I have a friend who's hospitalized with COVID right now. Oh no, um, I'm so yeah, sorry. I myself am severely, severely immunocompromised. So um, it's actually been terrible. And it's, oh, you must be so fearful. Gosh. It's really bad. And um, yeah, I mean, I could literally die. And, um, you know, I actually had to pull out of Politics and Prose, a bookstore in DC. Yeah. I was supposed to do an event at because they wouldn't let me um, require masking, which is crazy, or do literally any COVID medication. Wait, 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 wait. That is kind of insane because yeah. you're such a big draw. You'd be able to fill the bookstore oh, even I had, if people would wear yeah. masks. Oh, I had That's, literally like, I mean, I had like almost 100 people wanting to come and even more. And I did end up filling up East City Books. So shout out to East City Books. who had Is that me. in D.C. also? Yes, they had in D.C. and they were able to. But, you know, it's just really, I think it's like deeply, deeply messed up that we have unprecedented levels of death. COVID is rampant right now. We're in the midst of another surge and people can't be bothered to take the most basic precautions like filtering the air and testing and things like that. So, You know, I'm so glad we're talking about that. And I'm sorry if I sort of, even as I started to say, well, it's, you know, over, you know, it's it's still here. In fact, um, this week, we had a, a federal judge who was going to be coming to my law school to like have motions, you know, hear motions for the mm -hmm. students. And at the last minute, he had to cancel because he had COVID. And we still have students. And and you're right. like People are still dying. People are yeah. hospitalized, immunocompromised. People are locked in their homes and have no freedoms and no ability to participate in public life because the nobody is taking any care. And I it's, it's really hard to failure. get tests too. I'm really glad. I ordered mine and they just showed up last week, the free test from Joe Biden again, because it's really actually hard. Like the other day when it was going back around my law school again, I went to my local like CVS, they were sold out and I had to like go into a Walmart. And I mean, you know, nothing wrong with a Walmart, but I'm one of those people who doesn't go there, I guess, because of their employment practices and stuff. And the people were super nice there and they actually had some tests, but so, so it showed me. Um, but uh, so other, so are you other places letting you require masks? Is that going okay? Yeah, that's a requirement. And it, by the way, was always a requirement. Like I, that was a precondition of me doing an event at any bookstore is not just requiring masks, but having layered the, mitigation. The filtering and... Yeah, like, or or just, you know, telling people, hey, look, if you're sick, stay home. I mean, I had, I think, over 100 people at the Strand, um, and we were able to make it completely safe. We had the windows open. We had 
people masked. I had the far UV lights. Like there are ways to make it safe. We know that the president, of course, has a ton of mitigations when he goes anywhere. Important business people have these mitigations when they go places. And I think everyone deserves access to, you know, a safe environment. I'm so glad to hear that. I have a friend, uh, Lita Seletsky. Do you follow her at all on oh, Twitter? Yeah. She does like makes these amazing cakes. She hasn't been doing those in a while. And she had this, and she wears very cool clothes. But she also, most importantly, as a writer, wrote this book called The Kneeling Man. I had her on the show. And it's about her father uh, was there on the balcony when um, MLK was shot. But she's someone who's been really vigilant um, about it. And she has these really cool masks that always match her outfits, but she was also, you know, she's still doing her book tour and I think it's been a challenge, but I think she's managing it. Um, so other, I know, like, I want to ask you one more sort of personal thing, which is I saw somewhere that you're a vegan. Is that still true? Yeah, I've been, <coughs> I've been vegan my entire life, pretty much. Um, I have a lot of food allergies. Um, just this, this is a breaking news. Uh, just this summer, I started to try to eat um, fish and chicken because I have a lot of health problems related sure. to COVID. Um, and, uh, I hate it. <laughs> I don't know. It's been so hard, but, um, yeah. I'm pretty, I'm pretty much now I'm about 99% vegan. Uh -huh. I think I had, I had chicken the other day at a book party cause I was doing a video with a food person. And before that I had had it in June. So, uh huh. But, but so yeah. no dairy? So dairy doesn't Absolutely agree with you? Absolutely not. Yeah. yeah. I'm like kind of ethically opposed to dairy just because of the treatment for the cows. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, yeah but um, and same thing. I'll never eat pork. Um, yeah. I go through families. these phases where I'm vegan. And then recently I introduced a little bit of fish because I just felt like something was, I was just not getting enough protein. I was getting sick of lentils or what have you. But I'm always really, really interested in like go-to recipes. So is there, do you oh, have yeah. some sort of quick, can you just throw some out at me? Like, and I'm not so interested in desserts, sort of more like entrees or salads that are your go-tos. Oh yeah. Um, well, I love just like a regular Greek salad just without the feta. And sometimes I put tofu in there. Um, mm -hmm. But I love lentil soups. My mother makes these like giant vats of lentil soups right. and they're That's so I good. I mean, you just put some like onions. You can throw like anything, any yes. kind of vegetables you've got in there and some spices. And it's just like warm. Even though I live in LA and it's warm all the time, I don't know. I like, <laughs> I'm a soup girl. Um, and I'm not, I, I'm always, I think being vegan so long, there's so much vegan drama on the internet and like policing of other stuff. And like, yeah, I've always been one of those people. It's like, do what works for you. Like, cause there are vegans that eat vegan, you know, but it's all processed and bad for the environment. And, right. not, you know, I think it's like eat whatever is sustainable, you know, whatever way you want to eat. So you want to throw it's so funny that soup. you should say that because like, I think about, you know, I've been focused on the last person I had on this, uh, recently that I interviewed was, um, uh, um, Zeke Foe, who wrote one of the Sam Bankman Freed books. Yes, wrote numbers, I have up. it. Ed, he's really fun. And uh, there was something he said, because I asked him, because I'd been reading in the news that Sam Bankman Freed didn't actually like sleep in that bean bag, that maybe it was just for show. And he's like, no, he really, you know, he really didn't. He, he said, in fact, it was so eccentric that like, you know, when CEOs would visit the Bahamas and he, when he was there, he just wanted to like, everyone just wants to see like him sleep there. So one time he actually saw him like fall asleep. And he said he like falls asleep for a really long time on the bean bag because he woke up and then he like, pop some nutter butters in his mouth and then went back to sleep. I think he told me that or I read it. And that was like, it was so funny because in, in, even in Michael Lewis's book, when they described the stuff he and those folks were eating who were like either vegetarian or vegan, like it was all really bad, like processed food. It's like, I just, I just don't put nutter butters on my list as like the way I want to engage in like eating. And, you know, I yeah. guess that's, that's my smallest judgment of SPF. I have like a bigger critique than that, but Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Oreos are vegan, so you can live off Oreos and stuff. They are. Vegan. I thought. Yeah. I thought only the um, Hydrox were. I thought Oreos were made with lard. They no, they're vegan. They've always sort of been vegan, unless they changed the recipe recently. But oh, yeah, it's been. That, I don't know. That's always used as the example of like. Oh, vegan I didn't know that. Food. Yeah. Well, it's funny now that we're going down this path. Like my, my one of my kids is so serious about being like vegetarian she eats cheese but she like marshmallows she'll only buy the kind that doesn't have gelatin in it and mm -hmm. like for me that's like for me that's a bridge too far but like like you said people i don't even like marshmallows what am i saying okay <laughs> enough of all the food you actually have a book out called extremely online and i found out that you're about to turn 29 is that true 
No, but that's very funny. I have a, a lot of age conspiracies about me on the Wait. internet. I am in my 30s. <laughs> Wait, but am I doing the math wrong? What? You, when were you born? I thought you were born in 84. No, 29. I don't. So first of all, I don't confirm my age ever publicly okay, because I've been smart. back so many times and it's yeah. the whole thing. I see. Um, but I am in my 30s uh, and I've been in my 30s. So oh. yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not. I'm no longer impressed with you. I think we need to um, end <laughs> well, this interview right when now. I, um, when I... Uh, when I went, I got on the Forbes for, or uh, Fortune 40 Under 40 list, um, like two years ago, I think it was. And um, the person, the editor said that they got all these letters saying, you know, because there's this conspiracy that I'm secretly 47. And Are you kidding? No, That's no, That's so no. stupid. Oh, it's a whole thing that like a significant amount of people, to the point that my Wikipedia has been edited a million times. And um, Okay. And I never don't say that I'm not because I – hopefully will be 47. Who's to say I'm not? I don't know. You know, like it's just right. a weird, I think the obsession with women's ages is really bizarre. And so, yeah, I never, I think no matter what age I am, I'm a tech reporter. And why do I, why is it an issue? You know, when right. I was in my twenties, everyone always said, oh, you're too young to cover tech. You're too young to cover tech now. I mean, literally Marie Claire just tweeted about me this morning and look at the responses. It's all Taylor Lorenz, AARP. Like the minute you turn 30 as a woman, there's a certain part of the internet that is vicious to you. And there is no, you know, there is no sweet spot. And yes, yes, yes. The speech in Barbie, you know, we've all heard it before, but there is no right age. There is no right look. There is no right race. There is no right, right weight or height or intelligence or accomplishment for a woman. Um, And if it is right, then you're arrogant because you're just right. So yeah, just, I, I kind of finally gave up on all that crazy stuff. Um, but yeah, so, I never, I never confirm my birth date or address or family members just because it's used for that value. is smart. So can we talk? So since you brought up this topic, like, you know, I don't understand why some people and you in particular. Why do you think you are a magnet for crazy conspiracy theories? Is it because you go up against people like that libs of TikTok lady or what do you think it is? At, or is it, can you explain? Or I mean, I know a lot of us get um, harassment. Some it can be more scary than others. Um, but do you have, do you have a theory or does anyone have a theory about this? Um, I mean, I, yeah, I think I know why it is, which is that I cover online influence, um, which is something, I mean, I, I'm an internet culture writer, so the internet is full of conspiracies and there's been a lot of conspiracies about me over the year. As, and, and I stopped trying to correct them because I think actually a lot of times what will happen is people will put out fake information or start these conspiracies in the hopes to get sort of you to almost correct it and give and then give them real, attention, right? Yeah. Give attention, but also get, reveal your real information. So oh, you say, that you don't want to. Oh, no, yeah. that's right. So this is like a tactic that's, you know, that's there are things that people do like that just because they're seeking to get personal information. Um, I see. So there's that. But I think the, the main reason that those people are so sort of triggered by me is that I write about online influence. Obviously, there's a certain part of the political spectrum that desperately craves it. Most of the, I mean, politicians of all sorts, but specifically the far right. Um, is very like that political genre is very intertwined with influencer culture, which is what I report mm-hmm. on. Lips of TikTok's a perfect example of that. Um, and I'm a like outspoken young, like young ish uh, woman, I yeah. guess. Uh, but I've been outspoken, you know, I, I don't, I cover YouTubers for a living. So I have a very high threshold for drama, I guess. So there's two threads I want to pull from that. One is like, it reminds me when you when you said, you know, online influencer culture, I'm reminded of <clears throat> days previous of like Gamergate mm-hmm. and whenever women were talking about the, the space. I mean, I think online culture is much more, you know, diverse in terms of gender, whereas Gamergate was the space that I think a lot of young men wanted to protect from any women, right? And so the Gamergate misogyny culture, which in a lot of ways kind of like led right into 4chan and all of the other stuff. I think this is maybe maybe different, but yet it has some, it kind of rhymes a little bit. And then the second thing, when you said like that politicians want to be 
influencers and, and things like that. I do think though, still there's this weird, you know, the influencer identity and being, you know, famous online, it's still sort of fraught, right? Because people want it, but they don't like, I still think there's still this aspect, at least I see that in academia, there's this way that you're not taken seriously if people know who you are on the internet. And oh, I yeah. decided at one point, like, to completely not care anymore about that. Like, I used to have to be really paranoid that my work wouldn't be taken seriously. And I just thought, well, like, who cares? The work should stand for itself. And my presence online is another form of communication, whatever. So do you find, do you think it's like that people are projecting onto people you like you who are writing about this culture, the kind of self-loathing they have about their own activity in this space? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, yeah, it's so funny. Academia is another <laughs> reality. Like it's, I was actually just um, talking to another academic last week who's a law professor and, and he was saying the same thing and he was- Wait, who I, are you talking to? I wonder if I know them. Oh, Noah Feldman? Yes. Yeah, because yeah. I visited, he's at Harvard. I visited Harvard in the fall of 2019 and obviously he's on the faculty. Yeah, okay. So yeah. Oh, what did he- He was oh, saying right, the that same article. Thing. <laughs> oh my gosh, the article about his fee. Isn't he yeah. engaged? Yes, and so. she's, that's a whole chapter in my book is Julia Allison's story. Oh, Julia Allison is the mm -hmm. same person. Okay, yeah. so I thought that was such a sweet story. Were you the, who wrote the story for the Times? Was uh, it, Joe Bernstein, you know? Joe Bernstein. Okay, yeah. I love her. So I thought, I actually loved the story. I thought it was really, sorry, I'm cutting you off, but like, I just want to say, I thought it was a sweet example of someone kind of tapping into the other, you know, people tapping into different sides of their brain, you know, opposites attract, blah, blah, blah. Also, she looks so elegant, like on the chaise or whatever. I thought it was great. I have to tell you the amount of snark that was in my Facebook feed about that. And I'm like, why? He's happy. Like, 100%. why do people... Why do people hate thriving. love? Julia's yeah. thriving. Julia's gorgeous. She's so successful. As I wrote in my book, like she was yep. an absolute internet pioneer. Yep. Every single thing that Julia predicted about tech and media in the 2000s, and I trust me, I read every single thing she predicted, came true. I have to say, as a tech reporter, I've never seen anything like that in my life. Like, so let's pivot to that because that yeah. was on my things I have to ask you about. Um, Julia Allison, she's this pioneer influencer, maybe the first one of the first influencers, maybe sort of after the mommy blogs, the way you, yeah. that's how you describe it. But she also had a kind of niche fame. So can you talk about how you see Julia? Because I think she's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, Julia was one of the first multi-platform influencers. So you had these mommy bloggers that emerged and they were the first to kind of really build, cultivate these personal brands and then monetize them in that way. Julia was a blogger. She was a YouTuber. She she would kind of made content wherever, like everywhere across the internet. So give me the time frame again, just, just for 2005, her. 2005 to 2009 was like her ascendance. Um, okay. She was around until 2012. I think she quit the internet in 2013 officially after her reality show. Um, but she... I mean, she, she made a full-time living in New York City as an influencer in 2006. That's crazy. That's incredible. No one was doing that. Not that's mention, before Twitter. That's be, that's sort of the blog, she, I guess, the blog era. She still. was really early on Twitter, too. Uh -huh. um, she, you know, she did one of the first deals with Next New Networks, which was YouTube's, that sort of became YouTube's entire creator program. Like I said, like every single thing that she predicted, she saw this media climate and this tech landscape years before anyone else. And because she looked like the way that she did and presented as feminine and wasn't afraid to kind of promote herself, she was just vilified. And the misogyny that she got was out of control. If a man had predicted the way that Julie predicted and had money behind them, like they would be the biggest tech genius in the world, you know? But it's like all of these men, primarily men, but also women, um, mm -hmm. just viciously tore her apart in, in one of the most misogynistic smear campaigns I've seen online. And who was her um, big antagonist? Was it Gawker or was it a different website? Yeah, Gawker. Yeah, Gawker. And her original sin against Gawker was that she would, she had a blog. And so she would go into the comments of the Gawker website and promote her blog, something that people literally Pretty do, smart. Like <laughs> everywhere. But the whole right. notion, I mean, the backlash to her and so many other women at that time, and women really built this sort of content creator industry now, is like, you don't deserve to be. Who are you? to decide that you deserve attention. Like how dare you take up space online and decide that you are worthy because you didn't go through a gatekeeper and you didn't have some man decide that you're worthy, you know? And they, and she built a following. It's a, it's a huge, like I saw somebody saying on Twitter too, oh, you know, she's only famous because of Gawker. That's how media people know her. She had legitimate fans. She had, I mean, 
people loved her. She was this like relatable young millennial kind of, I think she might technically be Gen, Gen X, but she was this like living this like aspirational fun life as like a young woman in New York City. And she was, mm-hmm. she has a great sense of humor and she's very smart and yeah, she was So crucified. what kinds of, so tell me the kinds of things before, because be, actually before we talk more about the kinds of things she does, I want to pick up on this thing about Gawker. It's so it's so interesting because I'm putting these pieces together like many months ago, many, 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 I can't remember, maybe it was spring. I had Ben Smith on when his book yeah. came out, <laughs> um, Traffic. And wow, I mean, his it, the misogyny he reveals there about, yeah. about Gawker, um, including, uh, you know, people that I know who, you know, who like, who were women in that world, but also, you know, he kind of opens up to what was going on there. And what I find so frustrating about what you're saying is, and you talk about this, this theme in your book, the whole thing about sort of online was the disintermediation of, of, you know, creativity. So people now didn't, as you mentioned, you know, don't go through legacy platforms, you don't need to like, climb the ladder and make everybody happy in corporate media if you're doing something interesting and good, sometimes something weird though, but okay, whatever. But even really good, you know, healthy, great content stuff you're doing, you don't need a gatekeeper. Why is it though so interesting that the men thought that was great, right? Irreverent gawker, you know, they they wanted to be disintermediated, but they wanted women to have to be intermediated through them. Like why is it, why can't everybody sort of just like share this democratized medium. Yeah, because they don't want, they ultimately want to maintain the power structure of the patriarchy. And so they don't truly want a democratized media environment. They want to maintain control and and maintain power. And you see that happening right now. I mean, especially in the past couple of years, as the Silicon Valley people have finally woken up to like this whole influencer industry, which by the way, they wrote off so for so long um, because it was dominated by women. They don't take that stuff seriously. Um, now they're trying to seize control, you know, by backing specific founders and like people like Jake Paul. They're like they're trying to kind of exert influence in that space. He's still around, Jake Paul. He was just TikToking with Vivek Ramaswamy. Oh, gross! Yeah, ew, ew. The two of them are just so unctuous. Is that the word I want? Ah, um, <laughs> wow. There's something. Speaking of Jake Paul, like you mentioned, so I mean, I you know, I'm sh- assuming that people know who he is, but um, can you tell? Can you share a little bit about Jake Paul and, in particular, some of the really grotesque? Uh, I don't the, the things that he did. And how he still got away with it, whereas like women who did far less were sort of deplatformed. Yeah. Um, I mean, Jake Paul. So Jake Paul and Logan Paul, their brothers, got really famous on Vine. And I talk about them in my book, this era of Vine stars. They blew up. They hopped to YouTube after the death of Vine. And they entered YouTube into the like right at the height of sort of the prank era of YouTube, which is when, mm-hmm. you know, like Logan Paul was walking around Venice Beach lassoing women reeling them yeah, in. Yeah, it was him then, who I meant. Yeah. 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 Well, oh, trust me, they're both... Actually, Jake is significantly worse than... Oh Logan. my gosh. Keep going. I want to yeah. hear all of it. I mean, Jake, I mean, as I reported for the New York Times, been quite credibly accused of sexual assault multiple times. He's um, mm. kind of terrorized a lot of people. He's, he's a big Trump supporter. Um, you know, he's, he's much more politically active than Logan, I think, um, and has really done a lot to, I think, mainstream a lot of far-right sort of extremism. Um, and, you know, they're both very rich. Now they're both sort of pivoted to boxing. Um, and yeah, Jake, I mean, Jake's just done a ton of really irresponsible stunts. He famously ran a content house called Team 10, which I also reported. Um, you know, he was the adult in that house, an 18-year-old managing a house of kids as young as 13 living there, content what? creators full time. Yes. One of which, whom was sexually assaulted within the house under Jake. Why were, why were, why were parents letting their, their minor yeah. children well, live with okay never mind that's a whole entertainment industry you know thing yeah. that's unfortunately relatively common and not relative it's it's a i mean look a lot of parents want their children to have opportunities their kid blows yeah, up online, i understand they want to follow their dream i think right. don't let them live with 18 year old jake paul <laughs> yeah that's but, um but yeah. logan was the one then who went to japan He's fit to the Suicide Forest video, yeah. So I will say, to, to Logan's credit, after that video and after that cycle of backlash, he did have this sort of like mea culpa where he was like, okay, this isn't who I want to be. And he did kind of take responsibility. He he He's mostly just been podcasting. He has this podcast, Impulsive, 
that's popular. Okay. I don't know. He he did this like long support. I mean, he's he's been much more advocate for sort of social justice type things. Like he he issued a huge support for Black Lives Matter and stuff like that. Like whereas Jake has just gone. Like, I think Logan has tried to grow up and become more mainstream and be like, okay, look, I did a lot of dumb stuff when I was 18, but I'm 25 now. Like, you know, I want to have an adult life. Jake has kind of just leaned further into the more extreme parts of the internet. And the kind of extreme, um, without without sort of triggering people, it was just, a, it, you know, it was, he... Uh, he put up on his YouTube channel some extreme content in a, in a place in Japan where people are known to tragically kill themselves, and it was yeah. just completely inappropriate. And I and, and I'm glad to know though that he maybe decided to grow up. But um, let's go back to Julia Allison because she's this pioneer. Can you just describe some of the stuff she was doing? Like what and you said, she was on Vine at the time. No, Julia was not. Oh. No, it didn't launch yet. But she had oh, Twitter. Right. She had she did what was called life casting, basically a lifestyle blogger. She blogged, she vlogged, like she had a show. So she did vlog. She yes. did video too. She okay. did video too. She the, she signed one of the first deals with Next New Networks, which became oh. YouTube's creator. So no, that's what you were saying. Okay, yeah, and she had it. she had stuff on Vimeo. She was doing for a while. Like she was a multi. That's what I mean. She was this like multimedia content creator in a way that was very rare because people were very platform specific until actually after Vine went away. Then people realized, whoa, like. You can't just, you need to sort of diversify your platforms. So she, but she always understood that once again, was ahead of her time and sort of knew that you had to like play these platforms off of each other. So she was early on Twitter. Um, yeah, she would. So was her content kind of like um, talking about her day in New York or what were the kinds of things that she was doing? Yeah, it was very like relatable young woman content that appealed to a lot of other younger women, like college age and right after college, like young girls, because she had this fun life in New York. She had a lot of friends. She was with sort of like not famous people, but like fame adjacent type people, you know, like the Mm V-list. Like sometimes she would be in like a big ad campaign with Justin Timberlake or something. Um, She went to a lot of events so she would document, like, she would, a lot about her dating life. She talked a lot about her dating life, which is something that gets you an audience on the internet as a young woman a lot. Um, mm-hmm. And she just kind of, like, let people into her life as this young woman. She talked about, actually, right after school, or maybe it came over during or after college, but she saw Tom Wolf speak. And she realized, you know, Tom Wolf has a real, like, brand and, like, has this suit that he wears and this aesthetic. His and, like, white suit. <laughs> and, like, he just has a real, like, brand where you, you look at him, you're like, oh, you know, he – you get his vibe. And so she wanted to be like the Tom Wolf of kind of like the internet. Wow. Did she, so what was, did she have a certain thing that she always wore or what was the? Yeah. Well, she had a very distinct style. Um, I mean, she's very sort of like feminine, um, which I think was also what people were reacting really negatively to. Like she likes pink. She likes to, you know, she has this like aesthetic towards her. Um, Mm -hmm. And she wrote, I mean, she was also a writer. She had a really well-known column in um, her college paper and then after college as well, she sold her life rights at, I think, the age of 21. Like, wow, she was just a real influential person. And anyone else, like a man, they would be lo- – I mean, Gary Vee is like a kind of an equivalent where like Gary Vee was also a relentless self-promoter, Gary Vaynerchuk, in that era. And look at what he's been able to – but like he's sort of made a whole career off that. But a woman who self-promotes even just a little bit is torn apart. I mean – yeah. I don't know who he is. I feel terrible. Who is? <laughs> oh, oh my God. He's like one of the most famous like marketers. If you Google Gary okay. Vaynerchuk, he's like a hustle bro type guy. Okay. Yeah. I will look him up and I'm going to be, I'm like, I'm cringing already when I lay for my future self that has to listen <laughs> to this and I didn't know. Um, okay. So, you know, in, just I want to rewind a little bit because she comes, you said she comes kind of, you know, online 2005, 2009. Before that though, we had the mommy bloggers that mm-hmm. you referred to. And even the even it's so pejorative to call someone a mommy blogger. I know blogger. they all have complicated feelings about it, and yeah, I was wondering if I should use that term. But then the, oh, yeah. the woman ultimately, a lot of them came to embrace it, and that is the term sure. that was it was called. So, so they were also to kind of not giving credit for that foundational work. They were giving you know a voice to people who happen to be moms, also have whatever kind of career. Maybe they're at home with their kids, um, and there's so. I have so what's tricky for me is I don't lump them all together, but I also understand some of the criticism. And I wonder, I think you kept 
I think you stayed neutral. You just sort of you sort of drove by. You sort of just said, okay, um, some people are concerned because they wrote about their kids and they were Barely. criticized. Yeah. I mean, the thing and is- you, But you didn't say, you didn't make a value judgment yourself. And I wonder, is there- is there the, what are the right boundaries? I mean, you're not a psychiatrist, so you well, probably don't know. But do you have a feeling yourself with what went too, what goes too far, and what doesn't? I have very, very, very. I could talk about this topic for hours. I've been thinking about writing a whole feature on it. Let's be clear: most of these women, most of them were pseudonymous. Most of them used pseudonyms for their kids as well. Most oh, good. Of the, most of those mommy bloggers didn't have photos. You forget that this was not. It was this was a blog. Oh, these were blogs. So right. these were people right, right, writing. Right. And at the time, it wasn't even that they were cognizant of privacy as much as it was embarrassing. And they didn't want people, they didn't want to be attacked for it because women were attacked. And so they were using these like weird pseudonyms or they were kind of ambiguous about things, but they were hyper, what they were hyper candid about was like their inner life as mothers and like not always loving their husbands, struggling to breastfeed. Like they were normalizing a lot of this stuff. And I think they get lumped in. I see. I'm thinking about something. I'm thinking about a different segment of that. That's interesting. I mean, look, that some of them that. did. Heather Armstrong, the most famous of them all, like she did talk right. about her kids. She really became like a true influencer and talked about her kids, but like, and her kids have complicated feelings around that. I mean, I talked to another child of a mommy blogger that was so happy that her mom was able to make a living that way. And, you know, and she used her first name, a lot of them, you know, but it was a totally different internet and they get looped in with like, parenting vloggers of today. And it's like, that's not what these blogs were. If you go back and read these blogs, like mostly it was just like moms kind of anonymously or pseudonymously like venting about things. That's so, that- and that's so important because I think when you can talk um, with other people, whether, you know, whether you're a parent or you have something else you're doing in your life that you're finding stressful, if you're alone and you have no context, you're not going to be good at doing it. You're not going to, you know, you're going to be struggling. And I think that I, I didn't realize I, I'm, I'm associating this with, with, you know, everyone sort of using their own name and, and uh, not everyone, but some of them. And I, I think I, you know, I didn't think it's about the fact like, that there weren't photos. Yeah. I mean, there, eventually there were, but in those early days, it was like the b- blogging was like hard, you know, like it wasn't very easy. You had blogger, and eventually it became very visual, especially it became very visual and then it became Instagram and then everything was like highly visual. And but, then all the micro blogging on yeah. uh, Facebook, Yeah, but I mean, Twitter do we whatever. chastise women in the public eye always? I mean, like women, yeah. that, like a woman gets famous. Oh, now her kids are under scrutiny. How could you do that to your family? You know, and it's like, I just, I don't think these women did, I, I'm very firmly on their side. I, I didn't want to yeah, defend yeah, yeah. them so hard in the book, but- because there are there are criticisms, and not all of them were responsible with their platforms either. But um, you know, and I and I hate the focus these days on the the mothers. Like, I mean, we have these tech companies that harvest children's data from the time they're in the right. womb, build public profiles on them, put some, not to mention the schools, the sports teams, the I mean, the clubs. Like all of them are putting this information about kids online. It's so much I found preschools with open Instagram accounts sports teams uploading all the kids highlight stuff to YouTube with I- highly identifying information. Like, mm-hmm. and yet who do we focus on? Who do we chastise for putting too much on the internet? Like moms. It's such a good point. I love that. I, I love that. It's such a good perspective. Um, and I also just want to say, you know, um, I think the backlash against people sharing their voice, um, you know, that hurts people. I mean, yeah. you look at someone like, you know, Heather Armstrong and so on. Um, so um, I want I want to uh, ask you about another part of the book, which I didn't I didn't realize this thing that was called the YouTube Adpocalypse. I yeah. love that that name. So there was a time. I don't know what the ad revenue is now, but there was a time it was nineteen billion. Is it still that high, or is it shrunk substantially? Oh no, it's grown. Think? Yeah. Oh, YouTube. it's grown. But there was a moment where, God, it's um, where Cutie Pie and other extreme content creators, um, where things started to get really ugly. Uh, even if they were trying to be ironic, you know, 
um, especially now hearing this, but, you know, having someone go online and say, I want to kill all the Jews, not cool. Maybe he thought it was ironic or funny, but he I think didn't that's say what that, I was, just to be extra clear. He, he had some people he, hold signs up. Did, in, right, so yeah, there was India. this, yeah. yeah, there was this trend on YouTube. It was a trend. And the trend was to get people on Fiverr. The whole joke was like, you can get people on Fiverr to, to do anything, do anything for, you, for right. almost no amount of money because there's these people in third world countries that unfortunately do that. So he paid these men, I believe they were in India, to hold signs that said kill all the Jews or something, which is insane So uh, by the way, you and I know what Fiverr is, but do you want to describe what Fiverr is for those people who aren't extremely online like us? Yeah. Fiverr <laughs> is basically a website um, where you can pay people very little to do anything, kind of make things for you on the internet. It's like a, yeah, it's like a services website that you can pay people, often because it is labor in third world countries that you're paying someone. So you could pay someone if you said, oh, I need someone to make a spreadsheet for me listing this, or I need someone to, what are the, what are the kinds of things people pay people on? Yeah, I need, like I a need a graphic made, PowerPoint? I need a podcast oh. edited, I need a PowerPoint spruced up, I need you to go, you can pay somebody to do anything. I mean, now it's more normalized to just do like digital tasks, but yeah, P- PewDiePie was like- Like TaskRabbit is a thing, It's like a TaskRabbit, right? but like more digital, but yeah, uh-huh. PewDiePie was like- I'm going to pay these people to say this horrible thing. And I mean, obviously it was terrible and that's why the Wall Street Journal reported on it and that sort of kicked Well, I off. call them cutie pie instead of pewdie pie. I'm sorry. I'm glad you. <laughs> and so it was horrible. It gets reported. He said, that's not what I meant. But that's around the moment in 2017 when some advertisers started to pull back. And is this when YouTube maybe started to do more content moderation? Is that what the result was? Or? Well, no. So the content, yeah, it was all sort of enmeshed together. So you had, I mean, you had this tech boosterism that really defined the first half of the 2010s and not a lot of scrutiny on these platforms. Media companies were very excited about the opportunities that come with Facebook and YouTube. Trump gets elected. 2017, he's sworn in. Suddenly people start to be like, okay, wait a minute. These platforms are playing maybe a negative role. Like it's not all kittens and cat videos and silly things. Mm -hmm. Like there's disinformation. There's, you know, Alex Jones, there's these, this, all of this problem. So I think Trump's election led to a lot more scrutiny. The media started to actually look at, okay, well, who are, for instance, the most popular YouTubers? And that this was the height of the prank era, the YouTube prank era, which is like some of the worst content you've ever seen on YouTube is like people staging fake acid attacks, you know, for views. Um, Meaning, what do you mean by a fake acid attack? People would, were, it was, there was this, there was a bunch of acid attacks against um, Muslim people. I believe it was in the UK. And so some YouTubers were basically pretending to throw acid on unsuspecting Muslim people for YouTube views and harassing homeless people, giving them, you know, Oreos with toothpaste inside, like just all to get the eyeballs, all to generate clicks. To generate, right. And right at this moment where that prank culture on YouTube was sort of at its, ascendance, um, that's when the, the media started to pay attention and be like, wait a minute, let's see what's on YouTube. <laughs> and it was like the worst stuff ever. And so of course they write these articles. That was the year that Logan Paul vlogged, you know, from the forest. Um, so all the advertisers pulled out because they were like, wait a minute, we don't want our ads appearing next to extreme content like this. Sure. We don't want to support this ecosystem. And so it cratered that it created this really difficult time for a lot of YouTubers. But that's turned around or there's some, is it sort of, have people been weeded out or yeah. what, what happened? Well, they, a bunch of people were weeded out. I mean, Alex Jones was kicked off. A lot of other people were demonetized. Obviously PewDiePie was kicked out of the Google preferred, you know, ad network and stuff like that. Um, the ad dollars have definitely come back to YouTube. I mean, YouTube is thriving, but they did end up they did end up making a lot of changes, actually, because of that. There was a report that came out recently saying that they, an academic report that said they had made real progress on tamping down on extreme content. It's still full of really bad stuff, but it's nothing like it was, you know, it was really unchecked in late 2016. So I'm curious, like, just to get a sense of how much money some of these folks are making, like when my, I have a 23-year-old who, when she was a teenager, was really into Miranda Sings. Oh my God. And we actually- We actually saw her, and she's like hysterically funny. Um, but I'm just curious, like, what is a hey, YouTuber? Jen, and then she was. Uh, did you follow what? Up? You know that she's been like really intensely canceled. What? Uh oh. What does she do? Is she <laughs> is she transphobic or something? Oh no. I mean, well, people had problems with that character anyway because she's essentially pretending to be a dis- mentally disabled or developmentally disabled girl. So oh. people hated that, but. 
what she was canceled for was not only that, it was um, inappropriate sort of making kids feel really uncomfortable when they came on stage during her live shows. So oh, you can yikes. Google. There's many YouTube videos oh, man, to be made I'm of it. I'm cringing. Yeah. I'm cringing now. I'm sorry. Well, anyhow, I'm curious, you know, because it was her and then there were some other – uh, other, a bunch of other people who are all start part of maybe loosely part of like the Hank Green, yeah, and John Green network, yeah. Um, don't forget to be awesome. That all that merch stuff. Um, I'm just curious, like what you know, because I think Crash Course the Hank Green was doing was kind of amazing for kids. I'm just curious, like wh- when you we say monetize, there's some people who barely got by. Maybe the same way like Substack is. Like some people make $100 a year. Some people make $100,000 a year. Some people make a million. Like it seems like, but it definitely seems like, the, it, so I'm curious on YouTube, what would someone, what did some of these young vloggers on YouTube, like what, what are they earning a year at that time? At that time, certainly not as much as they are now. I mean, you okay, could, now give us an example. Well, now like, what I do mean, you think? Mr. I think Mr. Beast was. I can't remember what Forbes said, but ninety-four million. He made ninety-four million or something last year. I'm sorry, Mr. Beast. Can you tell us some more about that? Yeah, Mr. Beast is the top YouTuber now. Um, he's surpassed PewDiePie famously, and um, yeah, I mean, these people, the top of the top, are making tens of millions of dollars, not off YouTube directly necessarily, although a huge por- portion of that is ad revenue from YouTube, but they now you use your internet fame to launch a brand. So Mr. Beast has a, a whole suite of brands that he's created. Um, or mm-hmm. Emma Chamberlain, right? Another big YouTuber now yeah. has a popular coffee line. Um, a lot mm-hmm. of YouTubers have fashion lines. Like they, but content creators, are, they're on So it's branding. I mean, it's basically yeah. your brand, instead of just getting, Hey, instead of someone pl- platform sharing ad revenue, now you're also able to like, and that sort of happened. You mentioned that right around that time of the 2017 was when when folks realized they could. Were the people earlier adopters for branding merchandise than that, or is yeah. that pretty much when it hit? No. So, well, 2017 was that year of the ad apocalypse, and it was also the FTC issuing this edict that you had to show, you had to reveal when you were posting sponsored content. You had to put. Ad. You, you can't just be posting it the way you would see in a magazine today if something looks like editorial but it's an ad they always have to like say this is an ad mm-hmm. and you're saying the same kind of thing on on youtube yeah uh, on yeah the rules were primarily it was across all social media um so twitter uh-huh. you know anywhere um you had to disclose sponsored content unfortunately what that did as i report in my book is really just make sponsored content more aspirational because everybody started disclosing these brand deals and brand deals we live in this hyper capitalist like hellscape where everyone's like, oh my God, brand deals, like that's the ultimate goal. So oh God. then you had a lot of yeah. people sort of faking sponsored content. Oh my goodness. Trying to act like they had a sponsor. That's a huge thing. Yes. That's so funny. Like, yeah. Oh my gosh. Because it says, because it By gives the way, I'm drinking right now, I am drinking a cherry Coke Zero and they are not a sponsor. <laughs> and in fact, this is probably really bad for my health because of the fake sugar in it. Um, but there you go. Not a sponsor. Okay, continue, Taylor. Yeah, it, I know it's very funny. But 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 no, I would be perfectly fine if Coca Cola wanted to sponsor this podcast because <laughs> I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan. Well, go ahead. I'm rooting for you. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, but it, I would say the entrepreneurialism, like the the sort of creating your own brand that that had started as I write about in my book, sort of with these fashion lines with companies like Lord and Taylor and Nordstrom that were doing these like fashion lines with influencers. Those lines were selling out immediately. And so those content creators were like, okay, wait, why don't I have my own fashion line? Why don't I have my own handbag line? Why am I advertising right. someone else's product? I could make my own. And it, mm-hmm. I think the rise of Shopify and e-commerce is very tightly wound with this too, where it's easier than ever to set up your own online store and create your own online Right. Products. Exactly. And also sort of like just the way print on demand, product on demand exactly. is pretty easy. Yeah. Um, so am I wrong to think... I- and maybe it's because I'm such a word person. I like to I like to like ingest images and videos, but I'm not a like it doesn't come naturally for me to make videos or I have you know other than putting up pictures of my dog Ponzu, like I'm not really that much into Im- putting up my own images. So do you see like um, do you see online is still being siloed between like the consumers of still images versus videos versus words or because I think like I feel like threads is trying to have it converge and that's not working for me because I can't decide who they are but that's just my view do you have thoughts on this yeah I mean I think we're in this weird influx period I think text 
I think there always is going to be space for text. Like, I don't think humans are going to stop communicating via text in any time soon. But mm -hmm. short form text content has been notoriously difficult to monetize. Video content is always easier to monetize. There is a tried and true ad model of interstitial ads, pre-roll ads, all of that. that. That's why YouTube was able to roll out their monetization scheme in 2007, because there's an established model. Right, because the ad just is, right, when you say interstitial, you mean like sort of in, in the middle of the content, you yeah. get a little ad, yeah. just like television. Like a right, right, right. Exactly. It's like, yeah, it's yeah. very close to, to sort of traditional yeah. advertising. When you have these platforms of just short form text updates or short form video, there's not an established ad model there. I mean, sure. a little bit more with video, but certainly not with this short form text. And so I think that's why Twitter was never able to monetize to its fullest extent and why you see platforms like Threads and others, like, it's kind of unclear. Like, they want that multimedia aspect because for advertising, it's just much more lucrative. And that makes sense why they were saying they don't want to be the, the news source. Uh, but, like, if they don't get search, I, then how can They're they do delusional. anything? They're delusional, by the way, about that. <laughs> by the way, I don't think they listen to my podcast because this is about books, not normally about media. But, like, what planet are they on that they think we don't want to search? I, like, why wouldn't I want to search? Yeah. Well, they have searched now, but they block tons oh. of words. But they block tons oh, of okay. words, which is they block highly newsworthy. For instance, you can't search the word COVID. You don't, or you can't search. You can't search the word Gaza, probably. Right? I, I don't know about Gaza, but there's a lot of like they're and they're trying to block it for misinformation. As I reported, and I interviewed a bunch of great misinformation scholars, blocking those words from search just allows the misinformation to be shared without un unchecked, basically, because you don't have the experts who can come in and fact check it and provide context. So and retweet it or whatever, and and, and, and give context. Yeah, give context yeah. to it. So it just. It's actually making it worse. They're doing it just because they don't want scrutiny and they just don't want to deal with it. It's a very blunt moderation tool. And yeah, I'm with you. I, they don't know what they're doing with that app right now. Which I was, I was so hopeful. Like I am, I am such an adopter. Like I was like all in at first for Mastodon. I was like, oh. you know, I was going there. I was like the Julie McCoy. And then I'm like, eh. And then I, then I, you know, every single one of these things I try. And now I'm down to like the website formerly known as Twitter, or some Facebook, some threads, and occasional LA Al Blue Sky. But like, I can't, I can't do all these things. And I really, I don't, I'm very sad about what Elon Musk has done to Twitter because I believe if he hadn't been such a dick, he could have gotten people to pay money. Oh, totally. I think it makes a lot of sense. And he should have allowed people to have real authenticated blue checks as opposed to pay for ones. There's a way, like why in the world, what an, what an utter moron, unless his goal was really just sort of, well, he's also a little, I mean, I, actually I shouldn't use the word moron. I'm sorry. I'm just being, but what, what a complete arrogant jerk yes. that he decided to do this because out of spite and out of just sort of like, you know, machismo, like I can crush things that you built. I can knock over your fun tower you made instead of like, he could have saved Twitter. So like, well, what do you, before we leave, what are your like thoughts on Twitter and the future? Yeah, I think, I mean, Casey Newton wrote about this and did a good, sort of was talking about it while a while ago. And I do think that this is a political project for Elon as much as a business one. And he has a specific okay, ideology right. that he wants to mainstream and through Twitter. And that's why he does a lot of what he does. But um I don't see hope for it. I like you said, like no one he's alienated. He's made the classic vine mistake. Like I write about in my book It's like you can't alienate every single big successful content creator on your platform and try to manually dictate who's popular because it fails. Like nobody wants to use it anymore. And the social uh, social products are very unique in the sense that the community on the apps is the product. And he is yep. sort of fundamentally cannot understand that value. Like that's why he thinks like, oh, people should pay me for the blue checks. It's like, no, blue checks are a service to your users. Like this is a service to your users so that they know. know, oh, this is the real Selena Gomez. By the way, Selena Gomez still doesn't have a blue check and is constantly impersonated. Like it's just ridiculous. But I think he doesn't care. I think a lot of it's about eroding trust in the media. I think that's what a lot of that was. It's so sad uh, for me. Uh, so where is where is the future? I mean, this revolution has happened, and I I agree with you that it indeed has been. Um, where are we? You know, wh what do you see? Are there early shoots that you're seeing? Early Julia Allison's and mommy bloggers doing something in the online space that you're seeing now that we should jump on if we have capital or just want to have fun. Yeah. I mean, I know the platform ecosystem right now is really in flux and I don't know what's going to happen with 
sort of that whole class of Twitter users. I do think a lot of core usages of Twitter has already been cleaved off by TikTok. Like TikTok is just where news breaks now. It's where commentary happens. I know. That's what my kids say, dude. Yeah, it's I, true. It's hard for me. It's, it's hard for true. me. Okay. Do you make TikTok content yourself? I have like over half a million followers on. Yeah. I'm always oh, on. damn it. See, you, get see on, you would another, be popular. Okay, this is my fourth cringe of today, Taylor. <laughs> but I try I'm gonna try more to do more TikTok. And I know that there are like nerdy kind of people people like on TikTok, but I haven't figured out I'm very much of an authentic person and I, I can't just do a thing if it doesn't work for me. So I don't know if I should just comment on legal stuff. I don't know. Can you give me free you know, advice? Okay, like if I was let doing me tell TikTok, you yeah. who has a really good TikTok that I point okay. to a lot. When people are like, I'm an academic. I don't know if I could do that. Jamel Bowie. Do you know Jamel Bowie from the New York Times? Yes, of course. He has a fantastic TikTok. He uses TikTok so well. He talks about things. Look at his TikTok because it's not – I think okay. a lot of people are like, oh, I have to get on TikTok and do a dance now or something. It's like, no, just be yourself. I think he's very – I think he has a very authentic TikTok and is like a good example of – you know, he uses it to talk about interesting topics and really engage in like thoughtful things that probably the type of discourse that used to be on Twitter. But um, but he's a columnist, right? Yeah, he's a columnist. Not an academic. Okay. No, no, no. Oh. And, but there are tons of academics on there too. Yeah, yeah, I just yeah. think that he does a good job of like... Oh, I see. He's just like kind of... I'm looking at... I'm just, he just kind he's of just like kinda, talking. Oh, he puts it in the camera and just like does his thing, right? Yeah. It just looks... Okay. I just think it's like... I, I just like his because the way that he does TikTok seems accessible. There's a lot of other smart interesting people that I'm like, just use TikTok like Jamel because he's doing great. People love What's the ideal amount? If if people are getting started on TikTok, is it the ideal three minutes or is it 30 seconds? Or what do you think people's attention span of? It's whatever you, I mean, it's whatever you can hold. If you are telling a really interesting story, I I think definitely over a minute is performing well in the feed. They're boosting long form content, but also don't ramble on. Like you'll get the cadence of it after you use Uh it a few times. I would say don't worry about fo- – the, the one thing that's weird for t- people on TikTok too is like it's just about like building a community over time. It's like any – you know, you don't have to like go viral. Don't worry about like your view counts or whatever. Yeah, I didn't either. I mean was, the thing that's weird is I sort of became viral on Twitter, but I wasn't trying to. I was just, you know, raging <laughs> and typing. You know what I mean? And I guess I could just use words the same way that I just say out loud, right? Yes. I don't have to – I okay. think you would crush it on TikTok I, because people love Wait, like people, you heard it here, Taylor <laughs> Lorenz, you would crush it on TikTok. Fuck yes. Okay. I'm going to do it. Hop on. Okay. But um, that's back to you. I always say this is supposed to be about my guests, not me, <laughs> but you know, that healthy ego that, that I have. Um, okay. So what didn't I ask you that you would like to talk about? Oh my gosh. I feel like we talked about a lot. I mean, I just, I really hope people like my book. Um, I love writing about technology and I think it's a really interesting, I think even if you've read every single Facebook book, which I have a tech book under the sun, like it's more, it's a lot, it's sort of this other side of the tech narrative that you might've forgotten about or might've lived through if you were alive around the mom. Oh, it's amazing. I should have mentioned that, you know, I should have said at the very outset, congratulations on Extremely Online. (laughs) It's amazing. I listen to it. Um, Sometimes I listen. That's why I don't have it in my, in my shot over here. Sometimes I listen, sometimes I read, sometimes I do both. Um, but I enjoyed it. I learned things that I didn't know. Obviously, I have a lot to learn. Usually, I'm very intelligent on this podcast, but I had three cringeworthy moments where I didn't know stuff that I'm going to now have to like Google and uh, put in the show notes. But um, it's an amazing book. I think you've not only captured this history and this transformation, but you have recognized the role that women play um, in ways that have been hugely ignored. And I think for anyone who is a feminist or just a human living on the planet um, would want to recognize half of us uh, who've been off in a race. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. Um, how do people find you if they want to find you besides in a bookstore, uh, f- besides your book in this book, in, in a oh, bookstore? I am on TikTok. <laughs> so you can follow me on TikTok. <laughs> I'm at Taylor What's Lorenz. What's your TikTok handle? At Taylor Lorenz. Um, oh, that's easy. So T-A-Y-L-O-R-L-O-R-E-N-Z. <laughs> Thank you. You're good at spelling. It's well, um, my right. last. It's t- the last three letters of my first name are the first three letters of my last name. So it is. A well, that's confusing. why I was getting. I was. I was having trouble. <laughs> I'll say it one more time. T a y l o r l o r e n z. Yes. So you don't just like get rid of the second time around. You allow the whole double. The double lore. Well, my friends do call me Tay or Tay Tay. So sometimes, but so I see. But I, ha- I use on- my professional. Not, not on TikTok. I'm also on YouTube. 
and Threads and everywhere else at Taylor Lorenz. I feel like I want to say thanks so much, Tay Tay, but I feel like we're not. It would be <laughs> we rude, can be but... we can be on that level. It's it's okay, my, it's my so... nickname. <laughs> Awesome. Well, it's been great. Uh, it would have been really fun to do this in person. I think that we would have had a nice time sharing some, sharing a glass of wine Thank or you some coffee. So much for listening. You, but enjoy the I, rest honestly, of your tour. Thanks um, so much for this. I know you time. don't see the video, um, but when we're talking on, together, on, I can just tell that, that Thank Taylor you. is Thank definitely so the kind of person that Booked Up was made for, the person who at the end of the party, I definitely want to sit down on the couch with, you know, kick back, have a glass of wine, catch up on everything that happened uh, that day and really any day. She is so knowledgeable about online culture and online business. As you heard, she is like the first guest I've had that stumped me several times on some of the uh, most famous internet folks. I did I did read her book and yet still, um, there is so much I don't know about this world. I'm also thrilled that she is going to push me, whether I like it or not, into TikTok. And uh, she promises that when I actually do my, I mean, I've done a couple, but like when I really launch this real plan to do either law or book related content on TikTok, she wants me to let her know so she can share it. So like, that's incredible because she has half a million followers on TikTok. So that's awesome. Um, I'm nervous about it, um, but I, I do enjoy, you know, I do enjoy being in the place where people are getting their news. And if that place now is TikTok, I would love to provide um, some content and some analysis around current affair issues that relate to law and to our legal rights. Um, so I'm going to I'm gonna find a way. Maybe I will do that. I'll make my launch date on my, my birthday in December uh, this year. So look out for that. I will definitely let you know. And I will be back next week with another show as we continue to explore the writing process and the nonfiction world together. Let us know what you think. Send an email to bookedup at politicon.com. And you can also write to me at bookedup at P.O. Box 147, Northampton, Massachusetts, 01061. To keep up with the show and our featured authors, follow Booked Up on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And please give Booked Up a five-star review. It really will help other people find the podcast. <laughs>